again um, we start a new lecture. Uh, we will just go through the last lecture and its contents and then we start the new topic. So, basically uh, this module is about the nonlinear dielectrics and uh, we started our discussion with a general discussion on uh, dielectric materials, uh, nonlinear dielectric materials and how they can be distinguished on the basis of crystallography. So, we found out that, um, that the classes that we are discussing uh, relate to what is called as non centro symmetric materials and even among non centro symmetric materials you can have vari variety of constraints. So, starting, the, starting from that we started with ferroelectric materials and ferroelectric materials are actually most important of these because they possess the properties which, which are unique uh, and uh, uh, other non linear dielectrics basically are subset are uh, uh, any ferroelectric becomes for, for instance piezoelectric and pyroelectric. So, that is why we started our discussion with ferroelectric and characteristic of ferroelectric materials was that they undergo a phase transition uh, when cooled or heated and this phase transition is typically uh, uh, when you cool it for instance from a high symmetry phase to a low symmetry phase and this is associated with uh, occurrence of uh, ferroelectricity in the low temperature phase. And, uh, and this you can see in terms of dielectric constant or susceptibility and depending upon how the polarization dielectric constant susceptibility change the phase, trans uh, the phase transition can be of first order and second order. And then we stumbled across uh, the ferroelectric hysteresis loop and in that uh, we found out how what happens when we pole a ferroelectric which means that when, when you apply electric field to a ferroelectric materials what happens to its polarization. So, of course, you come across a hysteresis loop what, what is the reason for this hysteresis loop and two non-zero states at zero field and this was explained on the basis of domain. Now, domain was basically uh, defined as a region of uniform polarization, uh, but you cannot have a monodomain state because that is energetically unfavorable state because then the depolarizing field becomes extremely high. So, uh, based on these constraints of depolarizing field and electrostatic energy, the, uh, mm, the domains monodomain state divides itself into multiple domain states. And uh, the type of domains that you will have of course, is uh, type of domain walls that you will have is of course, determined by the crystallography, but uh, in general uh, you have variety of these domain, uh, domain walls which give rise to these domains. Now, what happens at 0 field essentially in a ferroelectric is that you still have some domains oriented in the direction of applied field. And uh, one of the important things in ferroelectrics is that when you switch the ferroelectric material or when you pull the ferroelectric material from uh, highest electric field to lowest electric field or vice versa uh, highest and lowest in, lowest in terms of polarity. So, minus E to plus E for instance, uh, then uh, since the domain have to switch back and forth from one orientation to another orientation in these materials this happens by nucleation and growth. So, whenever you change the field polarity it is always the it is always the new domains which form by, by the process of nucleation and then they grow uh, into the crystal at the expense of old domains. So, um, so, for instance, if you start from a domain state, let us say you start from a domain state like this and so, which means at this point the electric field was also like this. So, when you now reverse the electric field, you go to this direction, then you have these domains which are nucleating and they are in the opposite direction and these domains grow as you reach the saturation field or field required for saturating all these domains. And that is what results in this uh, classic hysteresis loop. So, you have a hysteresis loop and these are the non-zero states minus p r and plus p r and what you have is minus e c n plus e c. And then we looked at some other, uh, then we looked at, uh, at an analytical treatment for uh, domain wall uh, width and we found out that uh, this domain wall width is related to, uh, to the uh, polarization of the crystal as well as the surface energy of the domain wall itself. And uh, so, uh, tip naturally larger the domain wall energy is uh, larger the domains will be because you would require, uh, you would then require to spend more energy in creating many more domains. So, as a result the energy requirement forces the domains to achieve uh, a larger size, but at the same time if the polarization is larger 
then again domain becomes smaller because larger polarization means the larger depolarizing field and then more driving force towards forming domains. So, it is the competition between these two energies which uh, forces the domains to uh, achieve a equilibrium configuration of, of a particular size. And then of course, we looked at some other intricacies related to ferroelectric material followed by the applications. Most touted application for ferroelectric material of course, is the ferroelectric memory uh, and due to inherent advantages as we discussed last time, uh, but it can also be used as a piezoelectric and pyroelectric and that is what is a, it they have been used uh, uh, for centuries. Now, the topic of this lecture is essentially piezoelectric ceramics. Now, now piezoelectricity is, uh, is basically um, an interesting effect which is essentially if you look at two terms piezo and then electric, piezo relates to stress or force piezo and then electric means you have of course, electric. So, it is coupling of stress and electric field or coupling of mechanical parameters with respect to electrical parameters. And this is what makes these materials extremely interesting, uh, because when you apply stress to them, you have electrical response or vice versa when you apply uh, when you apply electrical stimuli, you have a mechanical response and this makes them extremely useful for variety of applications and uh, as we will see later on. Now, this effect piezoelectricity was discovered in 1988, oh, sorry um, 1888, I am sorry. by Curie in uh, 1988 and uh, this was essentially called as at that time or th this was later called on as direct piezoelectric effect. And basically uh, it was observed as some materials having capability to create an electrical potential in response to the application of mechanical stress. So, what, what was observed was that um, a, a stress uh, a stress was applied and this gave rise to uh, let us say uh, a polarization or a field or whatever uh, some electrical response. So, this was observed by Curie in 1988 and, and for a variety of reasons this application of stress leads to the changes in the uh, electrical parameters. So, uh, one of the requirement for this was that uh, and another thing was uh, the, um, uh, before we go into the requirements another uh, the, the, the converse piezoelectric effect and uh, soon after uh, soon after this discovery of uh, piezoelectric effect in 1888 by curie uh, um, then you have the, then you had this discovery of uh, uh, indirect piezoelectric effect and this happened in uh, uh, almost a year later. And so, roughly around 1880s you have you had these studies by Curie which led to uh, direct piezoelectric effect followed by demonstration of uh, indirect piezoelectric effect soon after. And then and this was later studied in a variety of materials for instance quads quads were one of the early materials which was studied and then you had uh, topaz and tourmaline, sugar or rather cane sugar and uh, then you had this Rochelle salt. So, all of these materials were studied in the beginning uh, after the discovery of piezoelectric effect in 1880s. Uh, by Curie and uh, other scientists. Now, this piezoelectricity, uh, the, the moment people knew that you know this is the effect which couples the electric and uh, mechanical parameters, they soon started realizing variety of applications. And uh, from the application point of view, the major impetus to the piezoelectric devices came from World War, the requirement of devices in the World War. So, there was a major impetus given in World War I, for instance, the sonar devices. Uh, uh, which were de developed from piezoelectric effect 
uh, were uh, first developed during first uh, world war and then later on of course lot of these applications came in second world war as well uh, new new class of piezoelectric materials were made as a result of the requirement and ongoing research and development in these this uh, this area and, uh, and that is how piezoelectricity got lot of prominence uh, during the world war so what we'll do is that we'll first uh, develop a general framework for piezoelectric materials what sort of uh, what is this effect uh, what sort of materials show this effect and uh, uh, then then later on what are the types of different effects and lo look at the ex mathematical expressions on how to express this piezoelectric effect mathematically so essentially if you look at the first topic which is the mechanism and mechanism is essentially when you apply stress so you take a material and when you apply stress to it the stress essentially produces a electric signal and this electric signal is in terms of some sort of charges uh, on the surface of the uh, le hang on let me just get this picture right so some sort of charges on the surface of the uh, piezoelectric material so this is basically a polarization but it's not only surface charge mind you this is this is happening inside the uh, piezoelectric so what you have inside the piezoelectric is the displacement of dipoles or the development of polar vectors of dipoles inside the uh, piezoelectric so when you apply stress so application of stress to a piezoelectric material leads to changes in the dipole orientations and hence changes in the polarization so you should not confuse piezoelectricity with only a surface effect the effect of applied stress for instance is felt inside the material and as a result of changes occurring inside the material in terms of dipolar uh, arrangement you have the surface charge which is which is being developed so um, and normally the field that you may apply that you may require to apply to these materials can also be very small it depends upon what is a uh, what is a coupling coefficient uh, of uh, of variety of materials but for instance if you apply uh, if you take quads you don't require very large field so if you take a quads piece of 1 cm cube so 1 cm cube is essentially 1 cm by 1 cm by 1 cm that's the simplest way to think of it and then you, when you apply a force for example of 2 kN now this 2 kN is very small force i mean if you just divide it by 2 2 into 10 to power 3 newton divided by 9.8 which is approximately 200 kg So if you apply just this a smaller force, uh, uh, 200 kg equivalent of force, then what you get is a voltage. It can exceed 10,000 volt. So just by applying a force of 2 kilo newton, the voltages of the order of 10 kilo volt can be generated on a very on a small crystal as small as one centimeter cube. So this piezoelectric effect is extremely strong. So it's not merely a surface effect; it's a bulk effect. It comes from the interaction when you apply stress. It comes from the interaction of the dipoles with respect to each other and the tendency of them to align along a particular direction during the um, application of stress. And the <coughs> the other effect, which is called as converse piezoelectric effect, where you apply electric field and this causes the change in the uh, mechanical dimensions or, uh, or, or 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 causes mechanical deformation in the crystal, which we will see in a while. So how do you express this effect uh, first of all what sort of materials do uh, do show this effect so materials uh, firstly the materials need to be non centrosymmetric and this we have already discussed in the beginning of module 5 non centrosymmetric materials are the materials which do not have a center of symmetry 
Okay. So, any material which has a center of symmetry will not be piezoelectric. So, this is the, one of the this is the most important requirement for a piezoelectric material. It has to be non centrosymmetric. On top of that, anything happens that is further additional constraint, but it has to be non centrosymmetric in order to exhibit any kind of piezoelectric effect. And uh, what basically uh, it, it, it means is that, and then you of course, you can have you know polar and non polar materials as well within this class. Now, whether it is polar or non polar will determine whether it is pyroelectric or ferroelectric, but it does not concern with uh, uh, with material being uh, piezoelectric as long as it is non centrosymmetric it is uh, uh, piezoelectric. And uh, uh, so, the crystal classes which show this uh, crystal classes which show this kind of effect are. So, you have uh, 1, 2, M, M, M 2 and then 4, 4 M M and then 3, 3 M 6 and then 6 M M. These are all polar groups, polar and non centrosymmetric and then of you have 1, 2 m 2 to 2 m m 2 4 4 bar 4 to 2 4 m m bar 4 to m and then 3 3 to 3 m 6 6 bar 6 double 2 6 m m bar 6 to m 2 3 and then bar 4 3 m. So, you can count the polar groups which are 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10. It's 10 are polar all these 10 are included in these uh, classes which are written below. So, these are all non centrosymmetric. So, these are all piezoelectric in nature. Okay. So, uh, uh, polar materials are the materials which have a spontaneous polarization. So, which means they have a unique polar axis and the materials uh, materials which show this effect are uh, both natural and uh, artificially made. So, uh, so for instance you have you have you have berlinite this berlinite is basically aluminum phosphate. So, this is a this is a very rarely found uh, phosphate mineral which is whose structure is pretty much similar to quads and this is again a piezoelectric material. Uh, as I told earlier cane sugar and then you have quads and then you have Rochelle salt and then you have topaz and then you have tourmaline. All these are naturally found materials. So, nature provides us with materials which are inherently piezoelectric in nature and of course, the most important them being quads. I mean quads has been used in variety of applications including the watches that we uh, wear. And then of course, uh, uh, the, 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 the materials which are um, and synthetic materials uh, synthetic materials uh, you can have starting from barium titanate a very famous it is a ferroelectric actually, but uh, since ferroelectric material is by default piezoelectric this has been used for piezoelectric. Um, um, so, this was the first ever uh, man made piezoelectric. So, barium titanate then of course, you have lead titanate and then you have lead zirconate titanate solid solution of lead zirconate and lead titanate and then you have potassium niobate and then you have um, um, sodium tungstate 
Na 2 W O 3 and then of course, you have lithium tantalate, lithium niobate and so on and so forth. This list, list is very long of course, you have uh, B I complex oxides like B I 4 T I 3 O 12, S R B I 2 T A 2 O 9. So, all of these are uh, uh, man made or synthetic piezoelectric material. You can have many other uh, naturally occurring materials such as bone is also a piezoelectric it has some piezoelectric effect and uh, um, also um, you can have wood can represents a piezoelectric material you can have silk which it can have some piezoelectric way, but but majority of the uh, piezoelectric materials that we discussed uh, which are naturally occurring are these and in the next slide basically these are the synthetic materials piezo of piezoelectric type now what we will do is that we'll look at now uh, the um, now the uh, mathematical expressions which are, which are used to uh, express a piezoelectric behavior. Before we do that just a small uh, uh, remark on the previous slide if you look at it here most of the materials which have piezoelectric effect tend to contain lead and this lead nowadays is, is has been termed by variety of countries as a poisonous material. So, uh, one needs to find alternative to the uh, lead free material uh, uh, to the lead containing materials which means we need to find lead free materials and there are some lead free materials and those are so pb free materials uh, pb free materials can be your uh, bifeo3 although it has of course issues uh, with respect to uh, uh, being used as a piece of electric and then any NBO3, sodium niobate, and and then so sodium potassium niobates, etcetera, etcetera. So many of these materials um, which do not contain lead are in contention nowadays simply because um, because of the fact that lead is um, is not a very uh, healthy material, healthy element. Now what we will do is that we will <coughs> look at the first. We will look at the direct piezoelectric effect. a little bit more quantitatively, so that we are able to understand it better. So, so direct piezoelectric effect occurs when applied stress to a material gives rise to change in the uh, surface charge density. Or change in the polarization and which can be detected as either uh, electric field or potential across the sample. So, essentially mathematically what it means is that that P the polarization is equal to d dot sigma. Uh, now, these have to be explained uh, more correctly in the vector notation which I will show you in a while. Uh, so, this is uh, this direct effect in the most easiest, fo easiest form is expressed by this equation p is equal to d dot delta where p is of course, the polarization d is uh, sigma is the stress and d naturally is called as a piezoelectric coefficient and this is actually a third rank ten tensor. So, now what basically it means is that pictorially you have a material and when you apply so when you apply stress to this material let us say like this sigma then you have polarization appearing like this and when you reverse the magnitude of stress if you make the stress like this then 
polarization also reverses its, its direction. So, this is what is direct piezoelectric effect. And essentially here the stimuli, so this is sigma. So, stimuli is stress and change is in polarization or directly charge density, whatever you may want to call it. So, this is what is direct piezo like in the in the simplest form. Now, the second effect is converse or indirect piezoelectric effect. Now, in the indirect piezoelectric effect what happens is when you apply electric field you have deformation in the crystal. So, what basically it has is uh, it is represented by epsilon is equal to E multiplied by D. So, this epsilon is the strain, E is the electric field and D is the converse piezoelectric coefficient. Okay. And so, here this electric field acts as a stimuli and this strain is the response. So, you can understand the converse converseness with respect to the previous effect. So, what it basically means is that you take this crystal. So, uh, when you apply electric field for instance in this direction, then it sort of expands. So, this is the new direction. So, electric field was in this direction and if you change the electric field to other direction. So, if you reverse the direction of electric field, so if I make now electric field in this direction, this will contract. So, this is what is the converse piezoelectric effect. So, uh, these are the these are the two effects which are of importance to uh, from the point of view of uh, fundamental understanding and <coughs> what now we will do is that we will have a look at the, uh, now these are all if you look at if you look at here uh, in the in the equations here the stress is a tensor as a result d is a tensor which is a piezoelectric coefficient. Again here, here electric field is a vector, strain is a vector as a result this is also a vector. So, uh, it can also be expressed in the form of uh, vectorial notation. So, for instance, um, the, the strain uh, let us say epsilon or let us say so here we define first the terms. So, if I say stress is sigma, strain is just to con just not to confuse with the electric constant, let us say strain is E and uh, compliance is small s, electric field is E and uh, what else? And then we have D as a as a piezoelectric coefficient. So we can write in the form of <coughs> coupled equations. So we can write this as so strain can be related to. And then of course, you can relate D, I forgot to mention D here, D is the dielectric displacement. 
and this you remember from module 4. So, d can be related as Epsilon, sorry, epsilon sigma into E. So here, this is the the first one is the D is the matrix. So uh, here, so this D basically is the matrix for. So these are called as coupled equations, okay? Because they couple the electric and electric field and stress effects. So D here makes the matrix for direct piezoelectric effect which is this and d t makes the matrix for basically converse converse piezoelectric piezoelectric or piezoelectric effect and this t term a small t term is basically the uh, transposition of matrix. So, if d was a direct matrix for uh, direct piezoelectric effect the transpose of it would be the converse piezoelectric effect. So, you can you can basically express the piezoelectric effect since since the uh, terms uh, uh, related here are uh, vectors or, or tensors as a related as a, as a result you can express them in the form of uh, matrix. And, uh, um, and basically the subscript here. So, you have these subscripts here a capital E um, um, sigma and these subscripts essentially mean uh, a constant or a 0 field and similarly uh, uh, 0 electric field and uh, subscript of sigma will mean constant or 0 stress field. So, uh, so basically this would be your converse piezoelectric effect and this is your direct piezoelectric effect. All right. Now, you can you can do um, so based on this. You have variety of piezoelectric coefficients as well, and uh, in total, in total there are four piezoelectric coefficients because of this vector notation. So you have four piezoelectric coefficients, and these coefficients are so. First one is d i j and this d i j is del of d i to del of sigma j at constant field and this is also equal to del of uh, e j to del of e i at constant stress. Similarly, you can also have another one as e i j this could be del of d i to del of epsilon j or epsilon uh, instead of epsilon I, I should write e j at constant field 2 and this is equal also equal to del of sigma j to del of e i at constant strain which is uh, e and then you have g i j which is minus of del e i to del of uh, sigma j at constant d and this is equal to del of uh, e j to del of d i at constant stress. And then last one h i j is equal to minus of del e i to del e j at constant d and this is equal to minus of del sigma j to del d i at constant strain. So, these the first set the first set of four terms which is here this is your these are your direct coefficients related to direct effect and these ones as you can see here are related to um, indirect uh, 
indirect or converse effect. So, and you can see details of these uh, mathematics of piezoelectric materials or piezoelectric uh, terminology in variety of books. Um, uh, for example, the books by so there are books by uh, Kenji Uchino, another book by Helen Mega. So these are the these are the two authors who have who have who have done who have written really nice books on piezoelectricity. So if you want to go into details of this, you can go to these books and uh, refer uh, for better understanding. Okay. So what now we'll do is that we'll um, now <coughs> look at some of the aspects related to piezoelectric materials. Now piezoelectric materials, likewise ferroelectric materials, they also have domains, and these domains. Uh, so, domain of course, is a region of uniform polarization. Uh, what happens in a piezoelectric material is you, you need to pole a piezoelectric material in order to get anything out of it. So, um, uh, what happens uh, is that in the, in the beginning of material, in the beginning of uh, the polling, before you pole it, all the domains are randomly distributed. So, what happens is that if you, if you draw a picture of, if, if I draw a schematic diagram of such an effect. So, the topic is basically polling of piezoelectric. So, if you take um, uh, typically, so this is let us say the grain size So, this is a typical polycrystalline material a ceramic okay so this is polycrystalline ceramic okay now before you have pulled for a piezoelectric material before pulling before pulling what happens is that in this material uh, let us say i divide this in variety of domains so these are our grains okay and within these grains you have domains so, let us say our domains are like this. Okay. Now, let us say we have a random distribution of before polling what happens is that we have a random distribution So, this is the picture uh, which is which emerges uh, just before the polling and basically what it means is that you have a random distribution of domains. So, random distribution of of domains before polling. So, if you have random distribution of pole, uh, domains, so even though material is polar, it has individual domain having indi uh, finite polarization, the net polarization P r net is equal to 0. So, what you need to the, do that in order to make use this as a in order to use this as a uh, uh, useful ferroelectric material, what you need to do is that you need to apply electric field to this material. So, when you apply electric field to this material, let us say in this direction, then what happens is that this material uh, changes its domain structure. So, as a result what you have is essentially you have a change in the di dipole alignment. So, now the picture can be slightly different. So, if I draw now the electric field to this material, now they are not going to look exactly similar because it's, these are all handmade drawings.
Okay, so these are grains. Uh, within these, of course, you have grain boundaries. So essentially, if the electric field was like this, you have more domains in the direction of light field. So essentially, you have bigger domains which are oriented in the direction of light field. So, uh, essentially you have here so essentially you have a larger so uh, application of field leads to domains aligned along the field. So, as a result what happens is that when you remove the field, so of course, this E as the E increases the P R also increases, but when you remove the field this all these domains do not come back to their uh, original situation. So, as a result what you have is when E is equal to 0 after polling. P r is not equal to 0 and this is what you want. You want some polarization to be present inside the material. Uh, so, you need to, so the important requirement for a ferroelectric material is that you need to, uh, for a piezoelectric material is that you need to pole it before you, uh, before you uh, use it as a piezoelectric material. So, now when you use this material, when you apply stress or let me just use different color. So, when you apply stress this gives rise to polarization and when you apply opposite stress it reverses the direction of polarization. So, this is what you you, re, you require to do with the ferroelectric material uh, piezoelectric material that you need to pole it before uh, uh, you, you use it as a piezoelectric and this polling process is nothing but application of electric field to a virgin material and then bringing it back to 0 uh, to create a domain structure which gives rise to a non-zero polarization. Okay. And, <coughs> last, uh, and now, I will give you some values of uh, piezoelectric coefficients for variety of materials. So, um, because the magnitude of piezoelectric coefficient represents the uh, extent of the effect. So, uh, for example, for quads, you can have piezoelectric coin so d basically picometer per volt and this is 2.3 if you if you if you look at the previous slides so here basically i'm looking at an indirect effect so picometer per volt so essentially if you have you have this 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 converse piezoelectric coefficient which is nothing but strain divided by the field and this becomes uh, volt per centimeter per volt or so, 2.3 picometer per volt uh, barium titanate has a value of 100 to 150. So, reasonably large displacement um, P z t which is lead zirconium titanium oxide this has 250 to 365 of the compositions which are close to morphotropic phase boundary and then lead niobate this has about 80 to 90. So, these are the effective. So, you can see that when you apply a volt, you essentially get a displacement of the order of hundreds of uh, picometers. Now, what this means is uh, 1 picometer is uh, essentially 10 to the minus 12 meter, and this is essentially 10 to the minus 6 microns. Okay. So, when you when you have a when you apply just 1 volt, you have a displacement of the order of let us say 100. Uh, picometer. So, 1 volt gives you 100 picometer. So, when you apply 1000 volt which is 1 kilo volt you get 100 multiplied by 1000 picometer and this is 
of the order of uh, 10 to the power 5 picometer, which is 10 to the power minus 1 micron and this is 0 0.1 micron. 0 0.1 micron is not a small displacement, it is a very large displacement, uh, because when we talk about the uh, when, when we talk about the material, the unit cells have unit ce the unit cell parameters are of the order of angstrom. So, if you look at the total displacement that the material has caused in terms of its dimension, uh, it is very large and given that, if you talk of uh, now this may not appreciate this may not be appreciable for a very big material, but when you talk about thick and thin film, this 0 0.1 micron is a very large displacement and this is this is what makes them very useful in the in the form of uh, actuators, transducers etcetera, where this displacement is massive. So, now uh, just like uh, you have a ferroelectric material uh, which can be poled, uh, <coughs> um, if you oppositely cycle a piezoelectric material or apply very high temperature, then uh, application of this high temperature and large mechanical stress can also lead to dis uh, dip disappearance of polarization. So, for instance, for a piezo ferroelectric material, you know that as you, as you increase the temperature, the polarization drops to 0. So, just like in ferroelectric material, in the piezoelectric material when you apply large temperatures or when you apply large stresses, they can result in the depolarization. So, for this I will show you a, a video and this video is uh, taken from uh, uh, the do it pomps website. So, uh, this this is taken from this reference which is uh, do it pomps .ac uk. So, you can go to this website. So, we, ha we, we acknowledge uh, their support in putting up this on website. So, this thermal depoling for instance. So, <coughs> now you know the polarization as it comes back to the Curie temperature, the polarization completely disappears which means the dipole moments underline. So, if you restart this, if I restart this thermal poling, so as the temperature is increasing, now you see how it how the polarization is moved. They were earlier in the reverse direction and they have now moved into the uh, direction. So, that uh, net polarization of the material becomes equal to 0. This is what is called as thermal depoling. So, it is opposite to poling. Poling is done to create a polarization, depoling is essentially a process which leads to disappearance of polarization. Now, not only effect of applied field leads to depoling, but also effect of large electric field also leads to depoling. So, <coughs> when you uh, when you place uh, when you apply an alternating electric field to a piezoelectric material and it generates a ultrasound because it undergoes deformation. So, as a result you create it, it creates ultrasound waves. Now, now the reverse when, when you apply the reverse field it depolarizes the piezoelectric and this gives uh, a strong enough field. So, if you restart this exercise, so if you, you look at it here and you look at look on the right side. So, polarize the net polarization of the material has. So, this is So, as you change the polarity, look at the polarity positive to negative, positive to negative. So, as you do this kind of depoling, you have the net result in the net decrease in the polarization <coughs> of the um, uh, material simply because the reverse field which is created it that that tends to depolarize the dielectric. So, this is because of converse piezoelectric effect. So, when you have direct piezoelectric effect, you create you apply you apply stress and this stress gives rise to polarization but uh, or electric field but whatever is created as a result of application that also leads to converse piezoelectric effect so uh, both of these tend to fight with each other resulting in the decrease in the polarization and finally you can also do mechanical depoling this mechanical depoling is essentially uh, basically when you apply a small stress to a piezoelectric material this leads to development of a charge um, as, as as you already know from the uh, direct, direct uh, piezoelectric effect, but the stress if the normally we, we are talking about the stress levels which are small, but when the stress level becomes very high, these atomic positions can completely change. So, they do not remain in those positions at all. So, as a result the dipole moment completely unaligned and uh, hence the polarization disappears. So, if you restart it again, so just watch this here. So, when the stress magnitude has become very high, then the dipole movements do not uh, remain as if they were just uh, moving uh, uh, as if they were doing in the in the case of small stresses. So, essentially what you have is 
uh, let us say you have this is the displacement of um, uh, from the central position of the central atom. So, when you apply small stress this keeps flipping back, but when you apply very large stress in the opposite direction this completely comes back here. So, as a result it flips over. So, the net uh, polarization decreases. So, this is what was demonstrated in the in the in the uh, previous uh, this uh, animation. So, if you just look at it again when the stress is small it just flips up and down uh, below the equilibrium position. However, when the when the stress becomes large then the atoms completely flip over from the previous position to a new position as a result unalignment occurs. So, basically what you have is depoling or disappearance of polarization by thermal means by electric means and by mechanical means. And basically the effect of all these three is to create conditions which lead to uh, either uh, conditions so that you have complete reversal of polarization in some region of crystal so that you have zero polarization or you have flipping of atom from its position to another position uh, which leads to again flipping of polarization in some regions of the crystal giving and uh, giving zero polarization or thermal means uh, such that uh, it just loses its polarization completely due to phase transition. So, <coughs> so what you have here is uh, uh, depolarization of material. Now, uh, uh, in the next class what we will talk about is uh, uh, what are the kind of common piezoelectric materials and uh, how do we make piezoelectric measurements and then what are the common most common piezoelectric applications. So, we will stop here today. Uh, and these topics we will take up in the next class.